Well, kia ora tato. I'm um, going to stand for this first bit because it feels weird sitting down. Um, I'm undergoing a bit of culture shock as this morning I was uh, deep in the heart of Te Uruwira National Park and now I'm um, surrounded by green lights and cameras and fancy microphones. So uh, the, uh, the journey continues. I've been working on a story on Tuhoi and Te Uruwira for New Zealand Geographic magazine that I've now been associated with since uh, 1988 when we first uh, started putting together issue number one and two of the people here on this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, dais with me um, were involved in that issue and um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all introduce uh, James Frankham and um, uh, he'll, he'll just talk about the outline, the broad outline of the photographic competition, and then we're going to invite each of the judges in turn to speak about what makes an award-winning photograph in the category that they'll be judging. Um, I haven't known James for nearly as long as I've known the rest of the people up here, the other three. Uh, with James, it's very much um, like the Maori proverb, the old net is set aside, the new net goes fishing. So uh, James has been in the hot seat for um, three years. Uh, or so, yeah, four yeah, years. Longer than that. And uh, so, he, anyway, he's the new net, and so I'm going to let the new net uh, just have a, have a few words with you. Thanks very much. I think the new net will stay sitting. Good. I'm glad I wore matching socks this evening. It's an achievement in itself. Um, the New Zealand Geographic uh, Photographer of the Year competition was uh, inaugurated about four years ago. And the purpose of it was to draw out new blood in terms of photography. That was the first purpose. And the second one was to encourage New Zealanders and, and the public to document uh, their country, their environment, and their own lives. Um, over the course of the last <laughs> three or four years, there's been about 10, or just over 10,000 entries into the competition. The best of them you see downstairs. Um, and the judges here, uh, as well as uh, Rob Susted and Tui de Roy, um, who judged in previous years of the competition, um, they went through all of those images and um, together as a team to select the winners that you see in the um, best of competition. Basically how it works is that there are uh, four categories, a wildlife, landscape, society and culture, and then a photo story category. Um, the public, it's free to enter and the public enter into it every year. And then the judges come together, they sort of go through each of the, um, their pools of images. Each um, judge has, is responsible for a, sing, for a single category and they go through that pool of images, sort the good images from the bad images, which is a relatively easy process, and then come together for the much more difficult part of the process, which is to sort the good photographs from the great photographs. And that involves an enormous amount of discussion, um, and you know, usually, <laughs> usually over quite quite some time. And we don't always agree in every um, circumstance. And so, each of the judges, in their own right, um, given their experience in the particular field, has sort of looks after their own category. And um, but we all have input and discuss uh, all of the images. And so that's roughly how it works. I wasn't really asked, asked a question, but I guess that's the answer. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. I like your style. All right. And the socks. <laughs> yes, thank you. Good. I'm sure you'll think of plenty more to say, James. So um, I'm just going to introduce the, uh, the other guys here. So start off um, immediately to my left, Arno Gasteiger, who I met in 1988. He was um, fresh in from Austria to, uh, to live in New Zealand. He, and he came and showed a portfolio to, um, well, to me. <laughs> that was, we, we were just two people starting off this, this magazine, had this dream, um, and in 1988, we were, we were just starting to think about what was going to be in the first issue. One of those stories, um, uh, we decided that um, taking a leaf from National Geographic's book, we would try to do commodity stories, um, a, t a, a genre of story which actually has now fallen into um, 
uh, National Geographic doesn't do commodity stories anymore. Um, it's like steel, wool, oil. You know, we, we used to love the relish these kind of knowledge-based stories. We did one. We wanted to do one on glass. We decided so. Um, Anna was living in Whangarei at the time, um, and uh, there, there happened to be New Zealand's only <laughs> um, glass window glass panel manufacturing company in, in Whangarei. So we got him to, to photograph that and also sent him up to um, uh, Parenga Renga Harbour in the, uh, in, the, in the really far north. And uh, Anna came back with a, an image that we ran on the, the opening spread of that, of that uh, story. And it was a picture of um, a, a hand holding a glass bottle tipping out this um, 100, almost 100% pure silica sand, just incredibly fine, incredibly white, brilliant sand that they have in Parenga Renga Harbour. And there in that one image, he had both the raw material and the finished product of glass. And, and it, you know, this, this um, uh, ability to envisage a story within a single photograph um, kind of secured Arno a, a, a position within the magazine, and he's, he's, pretty, he's been there ever since. So um, Arno's category in, in, in judging is going to be people. Uh, I think they call it the fancy name of um, society and culture. Essentially, it's people. So I'm just going to ask him now, what makes a great people photograph? Uh, thanks for the introduction. It sounded really good. Um, I want to be surprised. So if I look through lots of images and something jumps at me, I get immediately energized and uh, I get inspiration from that. I just want to get up, run out the door and take photographs myself. So when, when do I get to this stage? Um, usually an image that does that to me, it's a very clear image. There's a lot of clarity. The idea the photographer has is communicated crystal clear. They're often quite simple images. When you look downstairs, you will see most of the images are very simple images. But it's not that easy to achieve, especially with people. You have your main idea, your main person or whatever, but there's lots going on in the background. And I noticed sort of the average photographer concentrates on the foreground, and if that's good, then they press the button. The better ones, they spend equally much on the background and there's lots of different subjects and it's all moving around and every now and then everything falls into place and that's when the great images are taken. Um, to achieve that, the photographer has to really stand at the exact place, a little bit here, a little bit over there, makes a big difference. And then you get often something of a surprise, like maybe everything is lined up, everything is great, and then on top of that, a wind gust or something, the hair blows, uh, some expression, the clouds part, a big shaft of light, lights up wherever you're photographing, and then you sort of come even to the next level, and that's, that's what uh, every now and then it happens and it's just, wow, uh, I want to do that. I get inspired. So that's sort of the ideal. Uh, my category is probably this, it's always the smallest. I think people find it quite hard to photograph people. Also the idea of approaching people, maybe get rejected, all these things come into play. So. Uh, yeah, it's exciting. I got, I nearly went up and got photographing with the last lot, so it's looking good. Good. Yes, I noticed that I tend to get those shafts of light whenever I start <laughs> taking photographs. You know, it's just a certain thing that happens with me. Um, uh, let me just t uh, go to the right now, and uh, Kim Westerskoff also was represented in the very first issue of uh, New Zealand Geographic. We did a story on um, the 10th anniversary of New Zealand's first marine reserve, Goat Island Marine Reserve. And at that time, 
there were really only a couple of underwater photographers of note in this country, and, and Kim was one of them. And uh, so uh, the relationship with New Zealand Geographic then, uh, we, we, I mean, I had a background in marine biology, so I had, there was going to be plenty of scope for marine stories in the magazine. And uh, so Kim um, came in on, uh, in, the, in the third issue, we did a story on uh, Tuhua, Mare Island, and that had a big underwater component, and Kim shot that. And then um, uh, <clears throat> there were um, there, there was there were several others, and we uh, basically anything marine or anything that that had feathers in marine, like seabirds, marine seabirds was Kim's passion as well. And so we you know he photographed uh, emperor penguins, and then there were humpback whales, and then we even sent him um, out on a, a trawler, an orange ruffy uh, uh, fishing trawler for for a week or so. And, and got him to document um, that side of, of marine life. So um, uh, Kim's category, uh, very close to his heart, is wildlife. So Kim, uh, tell us what makes a great wildlife photograph. Just before I get on to that, Kennedy, thank you. Um, yeah, and on that fishing boat, the writer that you sent out was seasick about as much as I was, so he stayed in, in the cabin and interviewed the captain for about 48 hours. But I... <laughs> I had to go out and actually photograph the orange ruffy and the, and the chaps themselves. Yeah, that was good. What makes a great wildlife photo? It's probably the same answer to what makes a great anything photo. And it's something like one that makes me or anyone else just go, wow. And beyond that, there probably isn't a simple answer. And that's the beauty of it. That's why we love it so much. If it was just a 1500 metre race like we're going to have at the Olympics, then you've just got to get round the track four times and be ahead of everyone else, and it's quite simple. Apart from that, it's hard being ahead of everyone else. Uh, but a great photo is like great art or great music or a great lot of things. It's, um, you often know it when you see it, but it can be hard to, to put a finger on. Um, this... It's a lot easier judging it, of course, than it is um, coming up with it. One of the ways of coming up with great photography, as far as I can tell, is just an involvement with your subject. And I'm a nature photographer just because I like nature. Nature behaves better than humans mostly, so I really like being out there. And it's what I'd be doing in my holidays anyway. And it's just this involvement over the years and love of nature and... Um, Every now and then the great photos come. It doesn't come from just um, jamming on the brakes and hopping out and going click and hopping back in. The chances of a great photo then aren't great. But the, yeah, great photo. Um, technique and technical things come into it, composition and being sharp and all that. Um, but we, oh, but a lot of the great photos aren't sharp. They're deliberately blurred. So even that doesn't come into it. So it can be hard to define. And tomorrow, all of us will be sitting in a room, I think, somewhere in this building, and arguing about all, all these things. Uh, the thing about wow, and the thing that will impress me if I'm looking through, I looked through 725 photos yesterday that James sent down. That was the number that entered the wildlife category. And the ones that really stand out are the ones where I haven't seen anything quite like that before. And this makes it really hard for you guys, if you're the photographers, because you don't know what I've seen before. <laughs> um, and it can be something that I've seen before, but photographed in a fresh, new, exciting way. So it can be the commonest fish we have or the commonest gull we have, a red-billed gull, but if it's in perfect light and there's just it all comes together. It doesn't have to be the rarest wetter we have or the rarest whatever or the, the hardest to get to place in New Zealand. It can be something perfectly common, but with just a, a really nice combination of light, those shafts of light that Kennedy always gets when he's out photographing onto something and just movement. And quite often there's, um, in wildlife photos, what really makes it is movement. Uh, an albatross just flying through it at high speed. The more something stays stationary, this is where Andy's life is easy because the landscape just sits there and he has, 
<laughs> he has to wait for the, for the light and the weather and, and to be in just the right place for it. But landscape doesn't move around much. Wildlife does, which is both the good news and the bad news. Um, but often the best photos are of movement and quite often that movement has to be in relation to the background. It has to be in just the right place. And that can be either just plain good luck or plain good luck or taking an awful lot of photos, yeah, being out there a lot. That'll do. All right, well, this, don't worry, we'll come back to you. Um, well, speaking of shafts of light, uh, let's, let's hand over to the master of shafts of light and also of places that are incredibly hard to get to that most people don't get to. And this is uh, Andy Apps at the, uh, uh, on my far left. And he, um, uh, pretty, soon, pretty early on in New Zealand Geographic, we, we, we realised we needed spectacular landscape images and that we beat a path to Andy's door pretty early on because we figured out that even the most remote and unusual places that we like to specialise in, Andy had already been there. And um, moreover, the kind of images he sent back um, let's let, let, let get away from this word images because in those days they were photos, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and Andy specialised in these big panoramic full sort of things like this, which I'd never seen before. I mean, they, and, and the, the, they just begged to be made into fold-outs, and so we made a lot of them into fold-outs. Um, but anyway, Andy's got the, uh, the landscape job. So, Andy, what makes a great landscape photograph? Well, it doesn't rely on luck like these buggers. You know, they go out <laughs> and wait for a bird to turn its head or fly in the right direction, or Arno's got to wait until someone's sober who, who wants to photograph <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> I've got to do the hard yards, you know. But before I get on to that, I have to say that there is um, still an opening for the award-winning image in the landscape. So if any of you have entered images, I'm open to suggestion. You can interpret that how you like, but come and see me afterwards. <laughs> no, um, I find it difficult uh, looking at through a series of images because it hurts me so much to see the, the obvious mistakes that are made. And I think uh, it's, it's a neglect of detail and lack of thinking. So I think that uh, so many images I've seen, I went through 12, 1400 landscapes and I had to narrow them down to 50. I got to 20 and I couldn't go any further. But there's some I was aching to give uh, an award to, I mean to put into that final 20, but I saw just a neglect of emotion and a neglect of uh, thinking, which really hurt me. They were in a good position to do something about these photographs, but uh, they, just for the sake of moving one foot to the left, waiting another half hour till that cloud made a pattern of shadow somewhere else rather than it was. It looked like a hastily grabbed image, and that it's what hurts the most. I think the, the photographs that really impact on me, the landscape photographs, are where I can see the person who created it, I can see what they're thinking, and I can see that they've gone to some lengths to get the right viewpoint. And there's nothing more satisfying than looking at an image and saying, I don't know how can I can prove that. I, I couldn't have moved an inch to the left, an inch to the right, up or down, I couldn't have waited for better light. And that's how it gets them to the top 20. But People are lazy, or they haven't got time. And I suppose I get a bit fussy after doing it for 40 years. But uh, I think to succeed in that genre, if you like, today, you have to go the, the full distance. You have to be dedicated to it. And, and it's just drawing attention to your, to your, to what your, <laughs> to your impatience, maybe, by presenting an image that's only half done. It's a half-baked thing. So I look for... I look for the creator's input, and I'm looking for creativity, uh, not so much a new viewpoint on an old, on an old subject, maybe, but, but a, a carefully thought-out viewpoint that is a, aesthetically as close to perfection as I can see that it's possible to get. Now, that's hard, that's, that's hard <laughs> I know, because it, not everyone's got the time that I have to go out and take photographs. I have to make a living from it, but I'm determined that if it takes me a month to get a photograph, I'll do it. But and I realise that the people who are entering these competitions haven't got that amount of time because they've got other jobs as well. But uh, it's still... And I'm also looking for simplicity of tone, simplicity of content, simplicity of composition. 
Well, an artist, uh, I forget who he was because I can't pronounce his name. I do remember vaguely, but he said words the effect that perfection is finally reached, not when you can add something to your frame, but when you can no longer take something away. Who? Oh, does someone agree with that or does someone say the name <laughs> of the person? Or were they just coughing? <laughs> Or drinking as this guy in the front row is. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> your best, one of your best friends come along, sits there boozing in the front row, and we can't drink. <laughs> but, no, that, that, that to me, it makes perfect sense. Because when I compose a, a photograph, I look at the scene in front of me and, and try and determine what it is, what, what attracted me to that. It wasn't the whole overall view. It was something in that that grabbed me emotionally. And, and, and the... And the, the um, the job then is to isolate that what it was that got you interested in that scene, and is it? Can I isolate that and not include the other rubbish that's around it? Because people tend to see through rose-tinted glasses when they're looking at landscapes. They'll see a beautiful ridge in the background, and they'll they'll choose to ignore the power lines and the and uh, the cars going past in the foreground or the footprints in the sand. But they just got eyes, tunnel vision that what they, what attracted them to it but they don't go that extra step and try and isolate it. So uh, isolation by minimalization, by tone, color, composition, and most important, I think, is seeing the photographer's thinking. And it really gives me pleasure to look at, look at someone's image that I can see this process has gone through their minds and they've done it. And when I can't see how I can improve it, I think it's got to be in the top few images. Uh, so it's a, it's a more um, disciplined thing, I think, than these guys do. They just, you know, <laughs> they've, got, they've got bloody uh, motor drives and they just flash away. Yeah. <laughs> 100 photographs of this, 100 photographs of that. It's just, uh, yeah, and then they go back afterwards and look at them and say, oh, that's not bad, is it? <laughs> Whereas, oh, Whereas um, trail and sorry error. about that, yeah, you guys. I had to bring that up. <laughs> but, uh, but, I like to think, I might be stayed, in my, and I'm getting old and stayed probably, but I like to analyse a, a scene and see what I need to produce it and then wait for that to happen and rather and come back with two or three images rather than a hundred and sort them out later. If I've got an image in the camera, I, I, know, I generally know, 100% well, of the time I do know that I've got it. I don't need to process it or put it through the computer. Sometimes my images are set when I was in film, they've sat in, in a fridge for a year before I processed them even. But I know I've got it. I know I've got it. I, I know I've got 100% confidence, even with digital, that I can put, it, put the raw file somewhere away, file it away, and then at my leisure, in the next year sometime, I can go back. But it's a great feeling to know that I've achieved it. And I'm usually right, <laughs> in my own case anyway. But so, so judging your photographs, or if you've got ent entries in there, all I can suggest is that a little bit more attention to detail and don't break the heart of the judges by, by skipping over things and, and doing a rush job on what I know when I looked at, look at them. I've got great potential and I feel like hitting the person who's presented and saying, or shaking them, saying, get back there and do it properly. Okay. So that's it. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that quote came from Groucho Marx. But anyway... Oh, um, which one? The one I'm going to shake and hit? <laughs> <laughs> the one about perfection. Um, now, just let me quickly come back to you on something. Because you used the word emotion, yeah. not a word we'd normally associate with a landscape photograph, which seems to be, you know, needing to be oh. pristine and so forth. Yeah. So tell me what you mean by, by, by using emotion when you're, when you're looking at a landscape photograph. Well, I'll tell you one story f first about that. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I had an exhibition in Dunedin, uh, where was it? Um, Dunedin Museum, Otago Museum, of my best landscape work. They were, they were really good to me. They, they, they chose, we chose 50 or 70 of my, my favourite emotional landscapes. <laughs> uh, I printed them, they framed them, which was a huge cost. They repainted the whole gallery, a bit like you've done here with, the, with these images here. They put on a presentation of my images that's will never be repeated. I was so proud of that, that they went to a lot of trouble to get the earth colours that I used, the simple tones, the simple construction of the, uh, of the panels and beautiful spotlighting on the images and had the right sort of ethereal music playing in the background. I think they even recarpeted it for, to keep the earth tones. I, I, I might be exaggerating there, but, <laughs> but they definitely repainted it. 
But the, the point of the story is that it was on for a few months, and then I live in Okarito, a small village uh, on the co west coast. Only 25, 35 people live there. And one day I was on the beach uh, with my chainsaw cutting up firewood uh, to tuck, cart up. I had my bike and trailer there. And I saw this big husky guy come striding towards me from along the beach. And I thought, he's on a mission, that bugger. What's he after? And he White went right bait. up. Hmm? White bait. <laughs> no, no, it was me. <laughs> he came striding up to me and stood there with his hands on his hips, just about from here to Kennedy away, and just stared at me. And I thought, oh, okay, he wants me. What have I done? <laughs> have I run over his cat or dog or whatever? Or <laughs> um, and I turned the chainsaw off and he said, Oi, are you, are you Andrew Saps? And he was a forestry worker and he retired and he was a rough, rough as hell. His hands were gnarled and his muscles the size of you know, horses' backsides. <laughs> and uh, rough as guts. And he said, well, I've got a bone to pick with you. And I thought, oh, God. What have I done? <laughs> I've only got a chainsaw to protect myself and I've turned it off. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm big, but he's twice my size. And he said, I, my son and I went to your exhibition in Dunedin uh, of landscapes and you made us both cry. Hmm. You know? And I think that, to me, still is the greatest compliment I've ever had. I've, I've won a few awards uh, you know, with prints by, that are judged by fellow photographers but that's what I initially became a photographer for. Uh, the only reason I became a photographer was that I was going to remote, beautiful areas that just about made me cry, that how, how beautiful they were, and I thought, how can I show people what we've got in New Zealand that is just so extraordinary that it makes me want to cry, whereas I, want, I won't, wouldn't cry in front of my wife about, about anything, but I would when I looked at a, a scene that was just so... Uh, um, it was, it's like listening to a soft bit of classical music. You know, I cry sometimes when I listen to a good piece of music. And when I see a, an image that is almost perfection, or it will be if I, if I can spend enough time to make it almost perfection, uh, it brings tears to my eyes too. And to, to realise that this rough bugger who worked in the forestry, cutting down trees, had the balls to come and intercept me on the beach, miles from anywhere. He drove into Okarito especially and knocked on doors to find me. And to tell me that was the greatest uh, reward I could ever have for the, the years I've spent photographing landscapes. So uh, what I see in uh, a landscape that is emotional is a flow of light and form that is sensual and soft, simple and not jarring, I suppose. And if you get the, that right combination, it's like listening, listening to some good classical music that flows beautifully. And an image can flow beautifully as well. And if, if you have something jarring in it, it turns into a, you know... <laughs> no, you know, no, I'm sorry, I'm just being rude here. <laughs> but, uh, and, and if there's anything jarring in an image, I usually try and go and take it again until I've not got anything jarring in it. So it's something that is a soft form that I can put on my wall. I know it's an often said thing that, that I, can, you know, I can live with this on my wall, and that is one of the criteria. It's something that's timeless and is full of simple beauty. Right. Mm. Well, I was just, just earlier today, I was reading a quote from the great American photographer Robert Adams, who said, great pictures cannot be just about particular landscapes. They have to d direct us to more, even eventually to the whole of life. And, mm. and I was also thinking of the great Cartier-Bresson, who said, the, 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 the act of, you cannot take a great photograph unless you are in love. So there's something here that, you know, that, that, that Andy's you know, touched on, the, the emotional content of an image. Um, and so I'm just thinking, uh, I'll, I'll throw this over to Arno and say, um, you know, with people photography, I mean, I have, I have wept over the, the pictures that Arno has brought back on assignments at times. There, I can remember an early assignment that he did on the Dutch community in New Zealand. And there were pictures that captured the nostalgia and the longing of, for home, the, 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 the sense of disconnection and the sense of, of love of the culture. Um, I can think of, you know, still now, and that must be at least 20 years ago, um, those images are sort of seared in my memory. So um, maybe, Arno, can you talk about how you get emotion into images, um, uh, if that's actually the, the, the thing we should be aiming for? Um, the same as what Andrew said, my response to any images 
it's always emotional. Like you see something and it speaks to me or it doesn't. And to do that, I think you need to know what you're doing with the people. Like you need to be part of the whole scene. You can't just turn up and demand an image. And we do spend time on mm -hmm. our assignments. <laughs> and you just got to be there yeah. for as long as it takes. And Could people forget about you. People mm. trust you. People do whatever they do if you were not there. And then, then that's where the interesting things start to happen. If we just go there, grab a shot, most people play up. They do something. And lots of people are happy with that. But to really uh, see how people live, how they relate to whatever they're doing, you, you just need to spend time. And Can you give an example? Can you, does something come to mind? I was just thinking, you know, that process is something that the great um, Werner Herzog in his documentaries lets the camera keep running and running and running, and it's at the very end, you know, that something comes up. Does, any, does anything come to mind um, uh, in terms of... I just remember an image I did in the Tokala Islands, uh, of an old man. I was hoping you'd bring that one up. Sitting on his bed. <laughs> um, I was, there are three atolls and um, we spend about a week in each one of them. Very remote place in the middle of nowhere near the equator. Uh, it's classified as one of the most remote places because it doesn't have an airport or harbour, nothing, uh, no wharf. So I was on this atoll and I walked past this house and I saw this old man sitting on his bed stripping coconut fronds and it looked really amazing, but I couldn't just walk in and take a photo. So I just went to the guy who was sort of organizing everything and said, oh, could you introduce me to the family? And he said, oh, yep, yeah, okay. And then uh, two days later he came, oh, maybe tomorrow. And so it took about four days, and finally I was in the bedroom with that man. Mm. And he just was doing his thing. He was blind. <laughs> he, I just <laughs> talked to him and sort of starting taking my photos. And then that it in itself was an amazing image. But then through the window appeared his daughter with a little, with her boy, and started washing the boy just right out the window. So I had the man in the foreground and then these two people in the background. And so the whole idea of generations suddenly came into play now. And that's a big topic in the Tokala Islands or in all these islands where young people leave uh, because there are not too many opportunities for them. So I don't change anything. Like I wouldn't say, oh, could you look sad or happy or whatever. He just does whatever he does. And I try to be like a fly on the wall. And it takes time and people need to trust you and they need to, uh, need to trust you and they need to sort of feel comfortable. And, and I'm pretty good with that because I'm not a threat to anybody. I'm sort of blending with everybody and people sort of, oh, yeah. And it's just always in the background. Um, same with Andy, when I looked through the entries, I got sad because sometimes there's some brilliant opportunities, brilliant uh, situations people are in and taking photographs and, and they messed it up just by not moving a little bit this way or that way or clicking the button a little bit earlier, a little bit later, or just waiting until the background is a bit more sorted. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really painful to see opportunities missed. So that's really attention to detail and just spending time. That's really what it's all about. And emotions will come unless you start sort of disturbing it by telling people to say cheese or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, this... Uh, mm. uh, many years ago, Arno um, told me a quotation from um, the, the wonderful sculptor Rodin that only that which is made in t with time will be remembered through time. And, and um, just wanted to, and in fact, I was, I was wandering through the wildlife um, side of the exhibition earlier this evening, I was noticing 
uh, you know, so many of the captions would say things like, such and such a photographer drove three days across Chad to get to a certain, you know, formation or walked for two hours at night in minus 15 degrees C, you know, to see to, for, for particular uh, conditions. Or uh, a friend of mine, Tom Pishak, wedged under a waterfall for two hours to try to catch salmon about to leap the waterfall. This sort of aspect of putting in the time. I'm just going to ask Kim whether, uh, you know, to, to reflect back on, on occasions where, um, where time has made the difference between um, an okay shot and a memorable shot. Before I answer that, while I'm thinking about the answer, <laughs> some of my photos make me cry too, but some of them are better than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all take a lot of rubbish and um, one of the best things that I've got some other professional photographer friends and one of the most useful things that this friend and I did once was this was back when we were shooting film we, um, we'd been on the same we call it work, our wives call them holidays we'd been up in Tonga and we'd been photographing whales and underwater and one of the things about being a professional photographer or even an amateur one that's trying to make their way and make other people think that they're pretty good is that you just show people the very few best that you've taken. You don't show them the okay ones and you certainly don't show the, uh, <laughs> the large number of really bad ones you got. But, um, yeah, so we spent a day just... We'd promised to show each other everything that we'd taken and uh, he looked at mine and thought, geez... Wester Skull takes a lot of rubbish, and I looked at his and thought exactly the same. Um, but that doesn't really matter. We were both... Um, what mattered was that we also came back with some really good images, and we made a point of, of pulling them out. And they end up in competitions and magazines, and life goes on. What was the question? Something about uh, something time. Something about time, <laughs> as I recall. Uh, I'm just Ken? filling in time. Yeah, yeah, I know, you're just stalling for time, but um, it, uh, we'll move on. We'll let you think about that for a minute. No, no let's uh, just do okay. a, a brief thing on time, because it's possibly more... It's certainly highly relevant to a, a wildlife photographer. Um, we all know that culture people and landscape photographers just go out and hop out the car and go click and, and hop back in. <laughs> but that's well known. Um, but the really good wildlife photos are ones where, yeah, you've been there not just minutes but hours, days, weeks. You've come back year after year. Um, in my case, I, for four seasons in a row, went up to Tonga just to try and photograph the humpback whales there and even talk Kennedy's magazine into sort of paying for one of them, which was great. Um, that was just after one animal. So there's just commitment and time are kind of almost interchangeable, but without... Com you'll be hearing some common themes that are coming through already, um, words like emotion and time, and time as in a lot of it. And time is also cumulative. Um, one of my best-known photos, one that's been used in many places, and you may have seen it, especially if you have any books on whales, it's of three killer whales coming out of the water, spy hopping in perfect synchrony. There are quite a few photos of um, orca spy hopping. That was done with Photoshop. That was, <laughs> <in the archive. laughs> that was like... Done yeah, it could Photoshop. be done in Photoshop now. <laughs> but it took now. a long time. <laughs> it took me ages to get the Photoshop bit right. You had time. Yeah. It was on film. I can show you the film. Um, yeah, what's unusual about that shot is that all three orca have come out and they're at exactly the same part of... The whole thing's over in about two-thirds of a second and usually there's one up there and one there and the third one thinking, oh, will I go up or not? Um, but the time thing there... Sort of working backwards from it, the only reason I was there, I was standing on the Ross Ice Shelf down in Antarctica, and the reason I was there was I just had 14 hours in a helicopter. I'd been given 14 hours by the New Zealand Antarctic program to get, to take, to get photos, mostly landscape photos, in the dry valleys. Um, I'd stayed down a month longer. My pay had run out about um, a month earlier um, and whether I was going to get paid for this extra month or not, I wasn't certain. 
It was at the very end of summer. The Americans had dismantled their helicopters. All that was left was one New Zealand helicopter and one New Zealand pilot. And I was there all of January just waiting for one fine day to fly across McMurdo Sound into the Transantarctic Mountains to, to get some of the, the photos that we wanted for the Antarctic, um, the Antarctic Visitor Centre in Christchurch. And I just hung on and hung on and thought, well, I'd rather be here than anywhere else and we just might get a, a good day. And finally, when it was just about too late, the pilot, Rob Nickel, rang up and said, it's all go, Kim, 8 o'clock down at the helo pad. We took off at 8 o'clock and we just forgot to come home. We flew across to the Transantarctic Mountains, flew around all day um, and, yeah, we didn't stop for anything apart from to refuel and, um, yeah, got lots of nice photos. And then, I don't know what it's like flying a helicopter for 14 hours straight, but as a photographer and continually thinking and composing and sharp and focused and everything for 14 hours and I had a headache by then and it was late at night by then. We were flying back to um, over the sea, well, along the sea edge, the edge of the Ross Ice Shelf towards um, McMurdo Station and Rob looks down and said, oh, there's some killer whales down there. Kim, do you want to go down? And then he thought about what he'd just said and realised the stupidity of the question and took me down. The, the ice was too rough for him to land, so he just hovered and I hopped out and the killer whales were just swimming around under the surface. I couldn't see where they were every now and again. They'd come up and go, Psst. nothing, followed by nothing, nothing. That's what killer whales do. They, they live in the sea and they do very little. <laughs> they live under the water. They do very little that's interesting photographically if you're above water. And so I wasn't getting any photos and I wasn't going to get any if that's all they did. But I hung on there and I was, just in case, I was just focusing on the bit of sea where I, I mean, I hadn't seen them for a minute and a half and they could be there or there or anywhere. But my feminine intuition told me <laughs> maybe um, about, and then suddenly in the viewfinder, three killer whales just rose out of, out of the sea. And I think I went click and they... <laughs> This was without motor drive, and this is in Antarctica, so you just take one photo at a time and then very slowly rewind the film. Just one click, and they were gone. And oh, at the height of the um, the spy hop, there's a little cartoon, a sort of speech bubble above them, saying, "Oh, it's one of those humans. We don't eat them, and <laughs> orcas don't eat humans. It's great." And they sank back and disappeared, and that was that. You can see how. The whole time thing came in there. The reason I got that job down there was 20, 30 years just building up um, techniques and commitment and camera gear and the desire to be in Antarctica and places like that and eventually got chosen for that job. And then staying on that extra amount of time, not being paid for it just because I wanted to fly across to the Transantarctic Mountains and then staying there all day and then even on the way back, there's killer whales down there, so down we went. So, um, yeah, another aspect of time, cool. time slash commitment. I think we'll need to wrap it up there, but you're, of course, welcome to join um, the fantastic panel downstairs in the atrium. But if we can please have a huge round of applause cool. for an amazing bunch. Mm.